Let's start off with some questions I got on Instagram. Sincha asked me about the best and worst things about <coughs> the best and worst things about being a full-time traveler. In a general sense, I guess the worst thing is all of the sacrifices you have to make to live this lifestyle. In my case, those sacrifices include, but are not limited to, being away from your best friends, being away from your family, giving up a lot of your hobbies. So for example, I play drums and guitar, but I don't travel with any instruments. So it's been a long time since I've played any of them. It can also be hard to meet significant others when you're on the road. You don't really have a routine. You don't really have a home. There's potentially identity crisis situations. I could go on and on about the disadvantages of being a full-time traveler. As far as upsides go, I'm gonna get a few obvious ones out of the way first. And that is that you're out seeing parts of the world every single day. You're meeting people from all over. You're experiencing new cultures and eating magnificent food. And now diving in a little deeper, I think I consider myself to be living a life that would be a real page turner if it were a book, meaning that anything can happen in the next chapter. I also don't think I will have many regrets later in life having done everything I've done up to now. And above all, I think the main advantage is knowing that if I'm not vibing with a place, I can literally just pick up my 10 kilos of belongings and move somewhere else and start anew. There's always a second chance at happiness when you travel full time. Julie asked me about the weirdest place I've ever slept and I have a good answer for this one. I once went to a beach town in the Philippines called El Nido and I thought I would just book a hostel once I got there. Big mistake. I walked around all day looking for a place to sleep, carrying all my stuff, and there wasn't one bed available, so I figured I'd start asking at some more unusual spots if I could spend the night there. One of those places was actually a nail salon, and they had a tiny room in the back with two beds, so I shared that room with a Filipino guy that was actually having the same problem, and everything worked out fine. So a nail salon is probably the weirdest one so far that I can remember. James asked me about the trip that got me hooked on traveling and I think I have two answers for this one. I think the first time I actually felt the liberty of being away from home was a trip I did to Buenos Aires with my school friends when I was about 18. But my first solo solo travel was to Thailand in 2014 and I think that's where the travel bug really bit me. Then it felt like something just jumped up and bit me. I was staying at hostels, meeting all types of interesting people, seeing paradise beaches all day, and yeah, doing a decent amount of partying. It was a real interesting mix of anything can happen at any given moment, and also having complete control over my life decisions. And let me tell you, that was quite an addicting feeling, so much so that I'm still doing it one decade later. By the way, if this is your first time on the channel, my name is Art, some people call me Gringo, and here on Gringo Nation, I provide you with weekly travel inspiration for you to go on epic adventures and how to do that on tight budgets, which is my current reality. Eduardo asked me which countries or cities I would consider settling down in. To make things a little easier, I'm just gonna straight up ignore all of the ones I can't afford, and let me tell you, that eliminates a lot of them. Rent in Portugal, for example, is quite expensive. If I could make that work somehow, I'm sure that would be a strong contender, but it's just not possible at the moment. I also just made it here to Mexico, so I can't really form an opinion on it just yet. I have a feeling it might tick a lot of the boxes, except for the rent as well, because there's a lot of Americans coming in here to Mexico and the rent is just going up and up. Albania is a country I would definitely consider going back to, especially cities like Tirana and Škodir. Also Georgia, of course, where I spent one year of my life, although right now it's really not a great moment with the war going on next door. Lately, I've really been considering spending some time in Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia, or even Kota Kinabalu, also in Malaysia. And in South America, I think potentially Colombia and some spots in my home country of Brazil. As you can see, Eduardo, I'm still all over the place. Adam asked me about the top three beers from my travels, and I thought it would be cool to describe 
three very different beer drinking experiences. Since every country has their crappy lagers, I thought I would start off by nominating one of them as the best one, and that is definitely Red Horse from the Philippines, which has an ABV of 6.9. So if you start having those babies around happy hour, you are in another dimension by nighttime. <laughs> Number two, every time I'm in Lisbon, the first place I end up going to is an artisanal beer spot called Fabrica da Musa. And as far as artisanal beer goes, this is definitely some of the best I've had in the whole world. They have a wide variety of amazing beers on tap and every time I go there seems to be something different. So definitely do not miss Fabrica da Musa when in Lisbon, Portugal. And last but definitely not least is the Kolsch beer and the general beer drinking culture of Cologne in Germany. Basically, you sit at a table and a purposely mean waiter will place 200 milliliters of a hoppy bright ale right in front of you. And the waiter will not only bully you into drinking your beer as fast as you can, he will also compete with you to see who can down the beer faster. And they also kind of slap you around a bit. It's all in good fun, actually. Bulgarian Bay asked me about my favorite and most hated meals in Nicaragua. So although I've had plantains in other countries before, this year I really started enjoying the heck out of them. And I think that started in Nica. I also really enjoyed having that vigoron in Granada, which is basically boiled yuca, cabbage salad, and chicharrones. I must admit the fried pork belly is a little too much for my stomach, but I think everyone should try that dish when in Nicaragua. And how could I leave out tip top the Nicaraguan KFC? I really loved picking out on that stuff. Places like that really make it feel extra good to eat so unhealthy. And I don't think there's anything I really hated about the food in Nicaragua. If I had to mention something, I would say that maybe the patacones were a little overrated since I just thought they were kind of dry and bland most of the time. Today's Onzi asked me about the best public transportation so far. I'll mention a few obvious ones first. So of course you have Amsterdam, besides the whole bike culture, I also used their bus system and that worked really well for me. I used the subway station extensively in Berlin. Of course, there's a lot of crazies around, but so is the nature of Berlin. Prague in the Czech Republic has an amazing tram system. And of course it's so beautiful riding the trams and getting to enjoy the scenery of Prague all day. I would say Lisbon is probably the transport system that I've used the most on this list. Not only the subway, but also the trains in and out of the city. And they also have a subway station right there at the airport, which is extremely helpful. One that may surprise you on this list is Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. When I was there, a subway ride cost like 20 cents, although I hear now it's gone up to a whopping 35 cents but it really works great and gets you everywhere you need to go. And it's also very Soviet looking still. So it's also kind of like a tourist attraction. And I also have to mention Melbourne in Australia, which I used for over a year of my life. They have an excellent train system and they also have trams doing loops around the city center all day. I may have taken a few free rides on that. Shh. I do remember using the subway system in Tokyo quite a bit. It was extremely efficient, but also really confusing because they don't have a lot of signs in English. So a lot of the time I did not have any idea of what was going on. And it's now been a while since I've been to these cities, but I do remember Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and Bangkok, Thailand having really good public transportation. It's Bliss asked me about my favorite tunes while traveling. And the first thing I want to say about this is that sometimes I don't have data on my phone. So if I feel like it's not worth getting a SIM card in that country, I do download a lot of playlists and albums to my phone to keep me company during those long travels. My listening strategy on Spotify is making yearly playlists of the songs that I'm digging the most that year. You can actually check them out if you search for Arthur Costa Manso on Spotify. Basically, whatever song I want to hear more often that year goes on the playlist. This one, for example, is the 2022 playlist. I also created a playlist called Oldies But Goodies that I listen to quite a bit and it has hits from the 1960s all the way to the 1980s. You can also check that out on my Spotify and lately two of my favorite bands have released new albums so I have downloaded those albums onto my phone and they are the 1975 and the Arctic Monkeys. 
Another thing I have to mention is that I listen to a lot of podcasts. It's mainly YouTube stuff, but I absolutely love、uh, podcasts about movies. I highly recommend you check out the Filmcast. Those three guys have kept me so much company over my travels in the last decade. Diego Arellano asked me about the most unique experience of my life, and I also want to say do check out Diego's YouTube channel. He is a fellow Brazilian creator like me, and I really enjoy watching his stuff. Go give him some love on his channel. Diego hiking up the Acatenango volcano, which I did very recently, was definitely one of the most unique experiences of my life. I had never seen lava before, and I think that is the most spectacular way to do it. Teaching English in a very rural part of China was also quite unique and definitely one of the craziest experiences of my life. Zero English is spoken there. It's kind of rare for them to see foreigners in those parts, and also their customs are just completely different from mine. It was pretty crazy not knowing what was going on for a full year of my life. And just to add one more, I think getting tattooed in a communist bunker in the countryside of Albania was quite the unique experience as well. And by the way, I have full videos about all of the things I'm describing in this video, so I will leave them down in the description if you want to dive a little deeper. Today, Zonzi also asked me about countries in which knowing English wasn't enough to get by, and although China tops that list like by far. I will say that a lot of other Asian countries, especially in Southeast Asia, countries like Thailand, the Philippines, and Indonesia, have a lot of tourists, so they're quite used to speaking English. So it's really not a problem in those parts. It's now been a while since I visited Vietnam or Japan, but I think outside of the touristy areas in those countries, there may be a bit of a language barrier for people who speak English. That said, this trip that I've been doing over the past six months across Latin America has been reasonably easy for me because I speak conversational Spanish. So I can't really say how it would have been for someone that only knows English. What I can say with some certainty is that I definitely spoke to a lot of people in Spanish that did not know a word of English. So I can imagine that knowing only English might raise some issues at some point. But whether it be through hand gestures, Google Translate, one way or another, the message always gets across. And it's always important to remember that learning the local language really goes a long way. Julie also asked me about the most expensive country that I've been to, and I think that would be Sweden by far. I still remember the first purchase that I made there. That was a cocktail, and it was about fourteen dollars. And I just remember thinking to myself, "Have I made a mistake coming here?" I think most countries in Scandinavia are pretty steep. I remember Hong Kong being really pricey as well, and also Tokyo.、Uh, do not miss that last train home in Tokyo; otherwise, you will be stuck paying a very expensive taxi ride. South Korea was relatively expensive, and of course, the United States is really costly. Between the rent and the tipping culture, it's just not for me. So much so that I'm currently next door here in Mexico, and I will not be visiting the United States. Now, jumping over to a few questions I've gotten here on YouTube. So I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that is subscribed to the channel. It's really been a crazy ride starting this channel. Only after six years of solo travel, after I had already. Done so much and not documented any of it, and then 2020 came in on top of that, which definitely was not the ideal year to start a travel channel. So I really do appreciate everyone that is tuning in to the journey. I hope I'm inspiring you to live your most adventurous life, and hopefully I've been able to give you some pointers on how to do that along the way. So thank you again so much for 5K subscribers, Green Go Nation, onwards and upwards. And I especially want to thank my channel members, Oliver, Nikki, Rob, and Richie. You guys have been with me since the beginning, and I'm so appreciative of that. The first question I got here on YouTube was from G Posner Eight, and he says, "Congrats on reaching 5K subscribers. Thank you so much, G. It's all due to people like you who are always watching, supporting, and commenting on my videos. So thank you so much." He wants to know if you need a SIM card for every country that you travel to. The short answer for that is yes. I have bought numerous SIM cards in the last six months, but they're usually quite cheap, so it's really not a problem. And trust me, if I'm saying that they're cheap. 
they're cheap. That said, I have heard of people from the States paying some sort of international fee and getting service all over the world. This particular person that I met had service way over in Albania, but I really can't speak to how that works because I don't know what service that is. If anyone else does know, please let me know in the comment section. But as I said, getting a SIM card in every country you go to is really easy and not a problem at all. If you want to find out which carrier you should use in a particular country, you can Google it and there'll probably be forums with people talking about it. But the best idea is probably to ask a local. That is something that I do quite often. In the past six months, I've used a lot of Claro. In Nicaragua, I used Tigo. And here in Mexico, I'm using Telcel. I have an unblocked iPhone and I've been using international SIM cards all over the world and I've really never run into any problems. So I hope that was helpful, G. Thank you again. My man Ali asked me what countries I would visit that I haven't been to yet. And I would say that right now my main dream is probably to visit Egypt. I would also love to do a safari in some African country. I've thought a lot about visiting Namibia. And I also really want to go to Bulgaria because it's really growing as a digital nomad destination. If I did go to Bulgaria, I would definitely go next door and visit Romania on that trip for sure. And I'd really like to visit some South Asian country, whether that be India, Sri Lanka or Pakistan. And you know what? Mongolia actually intrigues me a lot as well. So let me know what countries are next for you, Ali, and thank you for being a channel member. Diana L says, congrats. Thank you so much for always tuning in, Diana. And she wants to know the most memorable slash delicious foods I've ever had while traveling. I have had loads of memorable meals in Georgia for sure. I think that country definitely tops the list. Two of my favorite dishes are from that country, the first one being the Ajarian Hachapuri, which is this heavenly bread boat filled with cheese, egg, and butter. How could you go wrong? And the second one, I'm gonna butcher the Georgian language here, but it's called Badrijani Nigzit. They don't use a lot of vowels in that language, it's a little difficult. But anyways, those are eggplant rolls with walnut paste inside, and I think about those daily. What else? The meals in Greece are always a delight. I love gyros, moussaka, and tzatziki sauce. But the main point about Greece is that I'm obsessed with feta cheese, and they put excessive amounts of that on everything. Eating sushi in Tokyo was definitely a unique experience. It's completely different from eating sushi anywhere else in the world. I'm pretty sure I had a shark there, but I can't be certain because I was walking on the street and I just waltzed into some random sushi spot that had like five seats. There were all these Japanese businessmen smoking in my face and I just ordered whatever I was able to and the guy brought me a slab of sushi. I've never eaten so much in my life, but it was absolutely delicious. And a friend of mine actually runs food tours in Tokyo. Do check out Japan food trips on Instagram. And Stephanie took me to the only Michelin star restaurant that I've ever been to. It's located in the subway and there are only 10 seats. That was definitely the best ramen I've ever had in my entire life. And it might just have been one of the best meals I've ever had. And lately I've been interacting a lot with the travel community on Twitter. You can shoot me a tweet at gringo underscore nation. And I got these questions from a gentleman called Architect in the Making. He basically wants to know if I prioritize seeing main tourist sites. Obviously, this depends a lot on how much time I have in the country. I love experiencing the local day-to-day -day life, but a lot of the really popular tourist attractions are popular for a reason, right? For example, it was my dream to see the Colosseum in Rome, and there was no way I was going to leave Rome without seeing it. But on the other side of that, when I went to New York, I didn't see the Statue of Liberty, and that definitely didn't take away from my experience there. If I only have a small amount of time in any country or city, I will definitely not be going from point A to point B trying to see every single tourist site that there is to see. I'll see what I can at a comfortable pace, knowing that those were my priorities for that certain trip and I can always come back to the country and see more. When I have more time in a country, I will do sightseeing at an even more relaxed pace. I'll also get a better feel for the local day-to-day -day life, but even then I will not try to see everything. I'll just prioritize what I want to see the most and also evaluate how much of that I can take in without it feeling like a chore because trust me, if you travel enough, it does start feeling like a chore and you really can't take in the beauty of all the places you are visiting. 
And you also asked about traveling light. Yes, that is definitely a thing. I have been traveling with only carry-on luggage for the past six months, which means my life is condensed to only 10 kilos of belongings. I've left a video in the description that explains how I packed for this trip, if you wanna check it out. And I would say that the secret to traveling light is bringing items that are very versatile and serve more than one purpose. And never ever bring stuff just in case. You really have to look at that item and think to yourself, what is the worst possible situation I can get myself in if I don't have this item? And 99% of the time, it's nothing serious, so that item does not need to go with you. And if you really end up needing something, you just go out and buy it. It's that simple. And if you notice that you haven't used an item that you have with you in the past month and you're not attached to it emotionally, just leave it behind. It's dead weight. If you are emotionally attached to it, but you're not using it, you can always mail it back to a friend or family in your home city. Let's keep this travel conversation going. I've linked here a playlist to help motivate you to get your foot out that door and start traveling, and also another video that I thought you'd be really interested in watching. So I'll see you guys over there in three, two, one. Thanks for 5K.